in that era of church history known as the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Now keep in mind that all of that played out in Europe and the western fringe of Asia between the Roman Catholic Church and what came to be known as the Protestants. The Eastern Orthodox Church was unfazed by what began as the theological turmoil to their west and would soon turn into a horrific and bloody brawl. What was left of the Nestorian Church of the East after their nightmare with the Mongol Golden Horde was even less aware of the trouble that was brewing about a thousand miles away. In this episode, we take a look at how the Reformation unfolded in England. The story of the church in England is an interesting one. The famous, or maybe better infamous, Henry VIII was king of England when Luther set fire to the kindling of the Reformation. Posturing as a bulwark of Catholic orthodoxy, Henry wrote a refutation of Luther's position in 1521 that was titled The Defense of the Seven Sacraments. And for it, he was rewarded by Pope Leo X with the august title Defender of the Faith. Ironic then that only a decade later, Henry would hijack the English church, oust the Pope as head of the church in England, and name himself its head. <laughs> These years of English history are interesting because of the marital and political shenanigans that Henry VIII played. The intrigues played out for the thrones of Spain, France, and England only well, make for some truly great drama. Many people don't realize that many of the most famous names of history are all lived right at the same time and knew each other, if not personally, at least by re reputation. If the story was done up as a movie, many would probably consider it to be just too far-fetched. Now, without getting lost in the minutia of details of Henry's multiple marriages, it was his lust for power and desire to produce his son and heir that motivated him to marry, divorce, remarry, and then, well, do it all over again and again. Henry persuaded the Pope to allow him to marry his sister-in-law after the death of his brother. Her name was Catherine of Aragon, the daughter of Queen Isabella and King Ferdinand of Spain, who we all learned in school were the reluctant sponsors of an intrepid explorer named Christopher Columbus. A Catherine gave Henry a daughter that they named Mary, but she bore him no sons. So Henry put her aside and married his mistress, the vivacious and opinionated Anne Boleyn. In order to set Catherine aside to wed Anne, Henry had to persuade the Pope, who'd taken some persuading to allow him to marry Catherine in the first place, to annul that marriage, saying that he ought never have been allowed to marry her. <laughs> Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was employed by Henry to, well, put pressure on Rome to grant the annulment. But Pope Clement VII wouldn't budge. So in 1531, Henry announced to the clergy that they were from then on to look to him as the head of the church in England. And it's at this point that the church in England becomes the church of England. For the next few years, there was little difference between Roman Catholicism and what later came to be called Anglicanism. But under Thomas Cranmer's guidance, the Church of England began a halting process of departure from its Roman past. It seems that this departure can be assigned in part to Anne Boleyn, a woman of astute intellect and firm convictions. She found much merit in the reformed position and had a hand in seeing Thomas Cranmer appointed as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Cranmer is an interesting figure. He seems in his early years to kind of vacillate in his opinions and comes off as being anything but a stalwart bulldog of Protestant ideals, as were Luther and Calvin. Yet he went to the stake at the end of his life rather than recant his most dearly held beliefs. And what he did in the Church of England was remarkable. Once the break with Rome took place, Cranmer quietly set about to install the Reformation ideas of Calvin in England. He didn't do much while Henry VIII sat the throne, but as soon as his reform-minded son, Edward, became king, well, he went to work in earnest. Cranmer was born in Northinghamshire and attended Cambridge, where he was ordained a priest. He threw himself into his studies, becoming an outstanding theologian, a man of immense, though not original, learning. In 1520, he joined other scholars who met regularly to discuss Luther's theological revolt. Now, Cranmer's theological leanings remain merely academic until he was drawn into the politics of the day. 
In August of 1529, King Henry VIII happened to be in a neighborhood that Cranmer was visiting. He ended up conversing with the king. Henry was trying to figure out how to divorce Catherine so he could wed Anne Boleyn. Impressed with Cranmer's reasoning, Henry commanded him to write a treatise backing the king's right to divorce and then made Cranmer one of his European ambassadors. It was in this capacity that Cranmer made a trip to Germany where he met the Lutheran reformer Andreas Osiander and his niece, Margaret. Both Osiander's theology and niece so appealed to Cranmer, despite his vow of celibacy, that he married Margaret in 1532. Because of the complex political situation in England, he kept the marriage a secret. In August of 1532, the aged Archbishop of Canterbury died, and by March of the next year, Cranmer was consecrated as the new Archbishop. Cranmer immediately declared the king's marriage to Catherine void and the king's previously secret union with Anne Boleyn valid. Cranmer advocated the policy of royal absolutism, popularly known as the divine right of kings. Cranmer said that his primary duty as clergy was to obey the king, God's chosen, to lead his nation and church. Time and again during Henry's rocky reign, Cranmer was ordered to support religious policies of which he personally disapproved, and he always obeyed the king. For this, Cranmer has been labeled a vacillator, a waffler, a leader of uncertain loyalty and fidelity to Christ. Was Cranmer's Lord the Lord of the Bible or the Lord of England? We're going to hold off deciding that until we see his end. In 1536, he became convinced, he said, by questionable evidence that Anne had committed adultery and invalidated the marriage. Four years later, he ruled Henry's proposed marriage to Anne of Cleves lawful. And when Henry sought a divorce from her just six months after that, Cranmer approved it on the grounds the original marriage was unlawful. Huh. Now, I think I'm going to do uh, a lessons from church history on all of this. So you can look for it in episode 14 called Stay Away. I think we'd be wise to be careful of assigning the archbishop the title of lackey. Yes, his flip-flopping on Henry's marital life is distressing, but given what we know about the king, what would have happened if he had opposed the king's wishes? He'd quickly have been shorted about nine inches, and Henry would have appointed a replacement bishop who gave him what he wanted. Cranmer had important work to do in reforming the Church of England and understood that he was uniquely positioned to do it. For sure, Henry VIII was a piece of work. But Cranmer was installing reforms in the church that would make sure that future kings couldn't get away with what Henry was getting away with. Though he bent to the king's will regarding his marital state time and again, Cranmer alone, of all of Henry's advisors, pleaded for the lives of people who fell out of royal favor, like Sir Thomas More and Boleyn, Thomas Cromwell. He even publicly argued against Henry's six articles, which were aimed at moving England back into the Roman Church. Then, in an apparent sign of weakness, when the six articles were approved by Parliament, he went along with the king's policies. But again, what else could he do? Some would say that Cranmer ought to have stood strong, like Luther at the Diet of Worms. If he had, well, it's debatable the church in England would have become the Anglican Church. Lest we assume that Henry was just a tyrannical spoiled brat who happened to be king, he intervened on Cranmer's behalf when court politics threatened the archbishop's position in life. It was Cranmer that Henry asked for on his deathbed. Now, the purely principled man would probably have held fast to his convictions and face execution at the hands and command of a corrupt tyrant. A purely pragmatic man would bend to the whims of the one in power. The hybrid, principled, pragmatic would chart the course taken by Thomas Cranmer. Maybe Cranmer dove into the counsel of Jesus who said that his servants, well, needed to be as harmless as doves, but as wise as serpents. With Henry's death and his son Edward VI's ascension to the throne in 1547, Cranmer's time arrived. The young king's guardian, Edward Seymour, began to make the Church of England determinedly Protestant. Cranmer took the chief role in directing doctrinal matters. He published his homilies in 1547, which required all clergy to preach sermons emphasizing reform doctrines. Uh, 
He composed the first Book of Common Prayer, which was only moderately Protestant in 1549, and then followed it up in 1552 by a second edition that was much more clearly Protestant. Cranmer also produced the 42 Articles a year later. Now, this was a set of doctrinal statements that moved the Church of England even further into a Reformed, and I mean Calvinist, direction. These documents became critical to the formation of Anglicanism. The Book of Common Prayer, though revised over the years, well, it still retains Cranmer's distinctive stamp and is used by millions of Anglicans worldwide. When King Edward VI died in 1553, Cranmer supported his cousin, Lady Jane Grey, as the new sovereign. She was even more reform-minded than Edward had been. As king, Edward had changed the rules of succession to ensure that she would receive the crown and keep his older half-sister Mary, the daughter of Catherine Aragorn that we talked about before, who was a staunch Roman Catholic from gaining the throne. But Lady Jane Grey was deposed in just nine days, and Mary triumphantly entered London. Parliament immediately repealed Henry VIII and Edward VI acts and reintroduced pro-Catholic heresy laws. Mary's government began a relentless campaign against Protestants. Cranmer was charged with treason and imprisoned in November of 1553. Then, after spending nearly two years in prison, Cranmer was subjected to a long, tedious trial. The foregone verdict was reached in February of 1556 in a ceremony carefully designed to humiliate. Cranmer was degraded from his church offices, handed over to be burned at the stake. He was just one of thousands of Protestants to know Queen Mary's fury, earning her the title Bloody Mary. Now, Cranmer's long imprisonment and harsh treatment combined to weaken his resolve. Hoping to avoid the stake, he became convinced that he should submit to a Catholic ruler and repudiate his earlier reforms. He signed a document that said, quote, I confess and believe in one holy Catholic visible church. I recognize as its supreme head upon earth the Bishop of Rome, Pope, and vicar of Christ to whom all the faithful are bound subject." Unquote. Even with this confession in hand, the royal court and parliament believed Cranmer had to be punished for the havoc that he'd wrecked on the church. The plan was still to burn him at the stake, but he would be allowed to make one more profession of his Catholic faith and so redeem his soul, though his body would perish in the flames. On the night before his execution, uh, Thomas Cranmer was seated in an Oxford cell before a plain wooden desk, weary from months of trial, interrogation, and imprisonment, trying to make sense of his life. Before him lay the speech that he was to give the next morning, a speech that repudiated his writings that had denied Catholic teaching. Also before him was another speech, in which he declared the Pope Christ's enemy and antichrist. Which would he give on the morrow? Well, the next morning, he was led into a church and when it was his turn to speak, he drew out a piece of paper and began to read. He thanked the people for their prayers. And then he said, quote, I come to the great thing that troubles my conscience more than any other thing that I have ever said or did in my life, unquote. Referring to the recantations that he had signed, he blurted out, quote, all such bills which I have written or signed with my own hand are untrue, unquote. Well, loud murmurs sped through the congregation, but Cranmer continued, quote, and as for the Pope, I refuse him as Christ's enemy and antichrist with all his false doctrine. And as for the sacrament, but no more words were heard by the crowd because Cranmer was dragged from the stage to the stake. The fire was kindled and quickly the flame leapt up. Cranmer stretched out his right hand, the one that had written the previous recantations, into the flame that he held it there as he said, this hand has offended. He died with the words of many of the martyrs. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Within just two years, Elizabeth I ascended the English throne and moved the church back in a Protestant direction, revising Cranmer's 42 articles to just 39 and adopting his Book of Common Prayer as the guide to worship. Today, Anglicanism and its New World counterpart in Episcopalianism is the expression of faith for 50 million people worldwide. As we end this episode, I want to mention two more who lost their lives in Bloody Mary's Purge, Nicholas Ridley and Hugh Latimer. Ridley was Thomas Cranmer's chaplain when Cranmer was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He eventually became the Bishop of London. He helped Cranmer write the Book of Common Prayer. Ridley was instrumental in altering the interior of the churches of England. 
He replaced stone altars with simple wooden tables for the serving of communion. He shifted the work of priests from sacramental and sacerdotal work inside the church to pastoral work outside of it. Hugh Latimer started out as a passionate preacher of Catholicism. When he received a degree in theology in 1524, he delivered a lecture assailing Philip Melanchthon, of course you'll remember him as uh, Luther's heir, for Melanchthon's high view of scripture. Among Latimer's listeners was a man by the name of Thomas Bilney, leader of the Protestants at Cambridge. And after the lecture, Bilney asked Latimer to hear his confession. Believing his lecture had converted the evangelical, Latimer readily agreed. But the confession was a stealthily worded sermon on the comfort and confidence the scriptures can bring. Latimer was moved to tears and to Protestantism. Latimer's sermons then targeted Catholicism and social injustice. He preached boldly, daring in 1530 to give a sermon before King Henry VIII that denounced violence as a means of protecting God's word. And for this he won the king's respect. He became one of Henry's chief advisors after the king's break with Rome. Appointed Bishop of Worcester, he supported Henry's dissolution of the monasteries. However, when he opposed Henry's retreat from Protestantism in the Six Articles, he was put under house arrest for six years. Freed during the reign of Edward VI, he flourished as one of the Church of England's leading preachers. But with the ascension of Mary, he was again imprisoned, tried, and along with Ridley and Cranmer, condemned to death. According to Fox's Book of Martyrs, Ridley arrived at the field of execution first. When Latimer arrived, the two embraced, and Ridley said, quote, Be of good heart, brother, for God will either assuage the fury of the flame or else strengthen us to abide it, unquote. They both knelt, prayed before listening to an exhortation from a preacher, as was a custom before an execution for heresy. A blacksmith wrapped an iron chain around the waists of Ridley and Latimer. And when the wood was lit, Latimer said, Be of good comfort, Mr. Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day light such a candle by God's grace in England as I trust shall never be put out. As the fire rose, Latimer cried out, O Father in heaven, receive my soul. And he died then almost immediately. Ridley, however, hung on, with most of his lower body having burned before he passed from this earth into heaven's waiting arms. Thank you.